Why don't you ask the people, when you, when you interview them, why don't you ask them, how many people have you got off drugs? Call them up, the local public authority, public health authorities, ask them how many people they've gotten off of drugs. Pierre Polyav was in London, Ontario, where he spoke to reporters about rising violent crime and the government-funded opioid disaster. One of the reporters thought they would be cheeky and ask Pierre for evidence that the hydromorphone tablets were ending up in the hands of kids. Well, that did not go well for the reporter. Let's take a look. Can you point us to evidence showing that drugs that are given out for free are ending up in the hands of children? Oh, I don't have to. You just have to ask the police and even the, uh, the, even the so-called experts have now been caught on television or on, on tape saying that they're, they're being diverted. And in BC, the public health authority, which has been a great advocate of this radical scheme, has admitted that it's ending up in the hands of ki- children. Uh, Adam Zevo from the National Post has given, uh, has done tr- intrepid reporting on this where he's shown that the cost of a hydromorphin tablet has dropped uh, on the street, has dropped by like 95%, because as soon as the addicts get the drugs, they resell it so they can buy something more potent. Uh, And uh, it it has been uh, handed off to kids. Uh, So uh, look at at what uh, the public health activists and even one of your, there's one, uh, uh, per, do, so-called doctor here in town who uh, was caught on tape admitting that there's diversion of those drugs. So it's really something when the media are, is, is the one, you know, asking for evidence of something that um, has been proven, but they're trying to put Pierre on the spot thinking that, well, he doesn't have an answer to this and we're going to make him look silly. Again, this is the problem with the media going with a narrative and not going, you know, just with questions of facts. I was going to say it's because the media has a narrative to push. They want to push this narrative that safe supply, safe supply. You guys know I don't really like that term. The term I prefer is uh, publicly supplied addictive drugs or PSAD. Uh, Anyway, but that PSAD is, you know, it's a good thing and it saves lives and it doesn't get diverted to the street. That's this narrative that the media wants to push for whatever reason. Well, and we talked about this in a previous video, like quite recently from the chief of police of London, <laughs> where they're talking about this is getting diverted. They seized, what was it, over 12,000 hydromorphone tablets since the beginning of the year. Yeah. Like that is a lot of hydromorphone. And, and, and it, again, it's dangerous. The dose makes the poison, right? Um, if the hydromorphone is like, one of the lesser opioids. Um, it's not as strong as something like um, morphine, for example, or fentanyl. But if you have that many, you can you can die. Like it's not a joke. You can die. Yeah. So and and let's take a look at um, some of this proof that Pierre is talking about. So here's an article from the Toronto Sun from Brian Lilly. Evidence shows safe supply diversion a problem. Dr. Andrea Serreta, one of the main doctors behind the London Safe Supply Program, refused to answer many straightforward questions about safe supply at a parliamentary committee earlier this year and tried to infer that pills were not being diverted. Quote, Do you agree that it's possible that diverted opioids are ending up in the hands of people they aren't prescribed to, or even children, Yes or no, end quote. Conservative MP Todd Doherty asked her in February. Quote, we have no evidence that they are ending up in the hands of children. We have no scientific data that supports those assertions, end quote, Sarita said. She lives in a city where police seized 30,000 dillies the previous year. And she answers by saying she has no scientific evidence to back the idea that diversion was happening. Did she ever speak to police? A while later, 
Serrata was speaking to an activist group called Moms Stop the Harms, and apparently when she thought nobody you know, who was disagreeing with her would notice, she admitted diversion was happening. Quote, I'm not going to stand up here and say that some kids, some adolescents, are not accessing diverted safe supply and using diverted safe supply, end quote. She said. Let's go over to Adam Zivo, who is the one that uh, up here invoked. And this is Dr. Serrata in the picture here. Adam Zivo, Safe Supply Advocates, admits kids likely use diverted opioids. For over a year, the progenitor of Canada's quote-unquote safe supply movement, Dr. Andrea Serrata, has publicly insisted that children do not access diverted safer supply drugs. Yet in a video presentation made to a group of harm reduction activists earlier this month, which Serrata apparently believed was a safe space among like-minded advocates, her narrative seemed quite different. Quote, I'm not going to stand up here and say that some kids, some adolescents are not accessing, accessing diverted safe supply and using diverted safe supply. Kids experiment with everything, and we need to be honest to ourselves that kids probably experiment with diverted safer supply as well. And quote, Serrata said during the annual general meeting of Mom Stop the Harm, an advocacy group that champions radical harm reduction policies. That's worrying to me as a mother um you know you can you can raise your kids right and teach them that drugs are not okay but how do you explain to them that you know when they have somebody saying well it's not a street drug it came from the pharmacy it's safe it came from the government and it's safe supply yeah how do you explain that to them that no it's not safe i mean you can't be around your kids every moment of every single day. Um, the best you can hope for is that you lay good foundations and that they listen to you and that they trust you enough to come and talk to you about this kind of stuff. Uh, but like the fact that the government is putting this stuff out there and making it available to children, whether they intend to or not, is horrifying. Well, and the other problem is throughout the whole education system, doesn't matter um, what the actual subject matter is, the end result is that the government and the education system are teaching kids to keep secrets from their parents and to trust strangers. Yeah. So what ends up happening is you have strangers pretending to be their friend and they're saying, hey, it's okay, this is safe. Gee, I wonder what's going to happen well, when you you know encourage a culture like that. And, and to that point, this whole term safe supply it's a marketing term and that's why i hate it because it's meant to kind of take the danger out of this oh well it's safe it came from the pharmacy it was prescribed to me it's safe it's not safe it's a moniker it's again a marketing term um, I don't think the government should be permitted to use it. So uh, the, de the evidence is in and it's final. And, uh, you know, I would also encourage the, the media to be more responsible. Uh, I, it is just so irresponsible for you to go and quote people who profit from the ongoing drug crisis as though they are experts. They are not experts. If they were experts, their policies, which have been implemented over the last nine years would not have caused 40,000 deaths, would not have seen an over 100% increase in op opioid overdoses. They, the last thing they want is for the crisis to end because they're, do they're making so much money off of it. Uh, we've got to stop feeding the activist class and start providing treatment and recovery. I would encourage you, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna cover this drug issue, stop talking to the people who caused the problem Start talking to the recovery centers. I would ask, why don't you ask the people, when you, when you interview them, why don't you ask them, how many people have you got off drugs? Call them up, the local public authority, public health authorities, ask them how many people they've gotten off of drugs. And That's this, a good point. This is the strongest argument against yeah. this. How many people have you gotten off of drugs using safe supply? Safe supply. Well, and their answer is, well, the goal isn't to get people off of drugs. The goal is to keep them alive so they can Make get the off of drugs. Themselves. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work. And we've seen with the Portugal model that in order to get this to work, you need additional supports in place. You can't just say, OK, you can use 
whatever you want at uh, safe injection sites or uh, safe inhalation sites, whatever you want to call them, you have to have the follow-up with the social worker, with the doctors, with the psychologists. I mean, most people do not start using substances because they're at a good place in life, right? So get those mental health supports in place and, and, and help people get out of that addiction. Yeah. Um, in, in most cases, why do people turn to drugs? Why do people turn to, you know, abuse of alcohol? It's because they want an escape from something. And that something is usually mental anguish or, you know, trauma in their life or something. One way or another, they need support. All they're doing is enabling this to continue. Because it's, it's interesting, the media in, rewards these people for the carnage that they're causing. They call, you call them experts. They're not experts. They're expert only at one thing, and that is perpetuating the drug crisis. Their policies have been implemented for the last nine years, and we see the results. The experts are the people at places like Harvest House in Ottawa or the Oak Center in Winnipeg where they bring people in and get them off of drugs. Let's start quoting them as the experts. And that's the <laughs> that's the right hook after the straight jab for the uh, for the argument here because it's how many people have they gotten off of drugs, and what are you doing arguing with me for? These are the people that you're calling the experts. They've they've implemented their policies. That's in. There's no discussion there. Their policies have been in have have been implemented. And what has happened? It's gotten worse. So common sense tells you that maybe those policies are having a counterproductive effect. Yeah, this is not the solution. I mean it seems like the left came in with these radical ideas like, oh my gosh, we've got this horrible opioid epidemic. Nothing's worked so far. Let's try this new thing instead. Peace ad. And then that made everything worse. So obviously that's not the solution. Good morning, Andrew Lawton, True North. I know you're familiar with Alberta's approach to drugs, which similarly to you is very much against so-called safe supply. But they have proposed a forced intervention, and in some cases, uh, really using the mechanisms of law to push uh, drug users into treatment under certain conditions. Would you support something like that nationally? I don't know. I need to study it more. I need to understand how it would work. Uh, I, would, I want everybody who's on drugs to be in treatment and re rehab to get off drugs. What I haven't been able to figure out is if someone doesn't want to be rehabilitated, can you require them to be? I don't know. I, I'd like to see some evidence for and against before I make a judgment. Tracy Gray from BC is an MP in our caucus, our common sense conservative, who's proposed that we have treatment in the prisons and that judges have the ability to make it part of a sentence that drug related offenses have drug treatment as part of the of the sentence so that the offender who may, perhaps they were involved in theft we know the theft was linked to their addiction the judge the judge could say while you're in prison you're required to be drug free and we're going to provide you with high quality treatment behind bars that makes sense to me because they're already going to be in prison anyway they might as well be cleaning up their body and their souls and and their addictions um, but I don't know if you can take someone off the street who has not committed an, uh, uh, that has not committed a prison uh, real offense and successfully rehabilitate them. If we can, I'm open to it, but I need to see more evidence at this point. What a refreshing answer from a politician. I don't know. You never hear that. Well, no, Ever. because they always have to have an answer because they, they can't look like they're on the back foot, right? They can't look like they don't know. They have to have all the answers. He's going to be the prime minister. He has to have all the answers, right? But the reality is, I think it's a very intelligent person who is able to say, you know what? I don't know because I don't have all the information. So I can't give you an answer 
because I don't have all the information. If I did give you an answer, it would be an incomplete answer or an incorrect answer. So I, that's why I think it's a smart person who says, you know what, I don't know, I can't provide an answer right now. Right, and, um, and it's mainly to do with the people that are refusing to, uh, to go and, and get treatment. What do you do with them? And that's the question, right? So um, I don't think there's going to be a silver bullet for it. There's, there's always going to be people that it just, it, it won't work for. But again, you have to take the Pareto principle approach towards it. How can we get 80% of them? And if you can't get 80%, how do you get 70%? How do you get 60%? And then once you've, you know, kind of solution that, then you can take that last 30, 40% and say, all right, how do we get 80% of those, right? You just, you keep slicing it until you've managed the problem. So I, I think it's, it's refreshing and it shows that maybe Pierre can be trusted because if he's saying, I don't know, that sounds like honesty to me if he's not just trying to say that he has all the answers for every single question. So I think it's a, a, a good thing when, if he doesn't know something, he says, I don't know, because you tend to believe him more on the other things that he does claim to know. Thank you. Next question. Craig Needles from Blackburn Media. You mentioned some of those rehab centers and the, the work that, that's being done there. How would you go about getting more of those open and in a timely manner as well? Because there are people who are using safe supply right now that if all, that was just cut off all of a sudden, they would be in a very difficult situation. It could be a life and death situation when it comes to withdrawal. So how would you be able to do this quickly? Because OHIP funded rehab is still very difficult to find. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people are, are clearly struggling financially. That's a very good point. It is too hard to find right now. And that's why a lot of people don't get help. They try. You know, they call a 1-800 number, they dig around, family members go scrounging around to try and find out what's available. They're then told that it's $40,000 to put someone in a treatment, um, Sebastian, uh, in a treatment facility. Uh, so I, I appreciate that it's very hard for people to get into these programs. Um, but that's why we need to repurpose the money that's now being sent, uh, spent on unsafe supply and harm production uh, and stop giving money to ha academics, bureaucrats, uh, activists, uh, and others who are perpetuating the problem, and fund the treatment facilities so that they can expand. We have treatment facilities. The problem is there are not enough of them. So, you know, if you went to the, the places that have proven track records of getting people off drugs, and you said, if we repurpose some of the money we're already spending, could you expand your service to more people? Uh, that, that, I think, is the best way to do it. And as I would do across government, I think we should pay for results. We should pay organizations that actually get results. The result is to get people off drugs. And as we get closer to the election, we will have more details on how we will repurpose those dollars to put them into treatment and recovery to bring our loved ones home drug free. I really like that approach. It's a very intelligent. Um, it's an it's approach. Common sense, right? Yeah. Well, it's an approach <laughs> I've recommended in organizations before because he's not suggesting that they, you know, bring in some new age treatment that, you know, nobody's ever heard before. He's saying, let's do our homework, talk to all the treatment centers some of the more well, well known ones, what are you doing? Is it working? And if they can prove that, yes, it's working, then you go to the treatment centers that they're having a really high amount of success and say, how do we now replicate that elsewhere? How do we expand that service? So your method can be used elsewhere so that you can help more people. Like that's how you scale up properly. Right, you don't come up with some crazy new idea like, oh, I don't know, PSAD, giving everybody government supplied narcotics and then go, oh, well, that didn't work. I guess we'll keep doing it. It's, you know, I, and I know some people will say, well, you know, it's by design. But remember, there's going to be some people that actually believe that this works. And it just boggles my mind that there was a discussion at some point that said, hey, um, I know how we reduce the amount of people that are using drugs. How do we do that? We put more drugs on the street than there already is by a significant amount. 
I don't think that was the conversation though, because I, I don't think they had any, any interest in reducing the number of people who were using. No, I, I agree. I think they were just like, wow, we've got, you know, X number of people dying from overdoses every year. What should we do? Oh, well, clearly it's the drugs that are being purchased off the street that are the problem. Let's give them pharmaceutically pure equivalents and that will save lives. Like it, it's, it wasn't about reducing addiction. It was just about reducing the number of people who died. But as I've said before, the dose makes the poison and it doesn't really matter if something's a street drug or if something's prescribed by the doctor or given to you by the pharmacist, it's got the same active substances in it and it can still kill you. 